Hi, Josh. Hey, Brink. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Brink Lindsay from the Cato Institute. Uh, Josh Cohen. I'm from uh, Stanford and Boston Review. I understand you were uh, down with the flu last week, but you're back. Uh, yeah, I'm back in as much back action as I'm ever? ever capable of. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was uh, yeah a little sick last week and uh, don't know if it was the the pig flu or what, but it was. Uh, but I am feeling better now. Thanks. Yeah. Good, and uh, that provides a, a perfect segue, I think, to our first uh, topic of conversation, which is healthcare. Uh, we yeah. have, uh, we've done blogging heads a few times and have, have talked about wrestling with this issue um, since it's uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest obstacles to getting uh, uh, liberals and libertarians on the same page, as uh, they frequently find themselves diametrically opposed about how to make the healthcare system better. Mm -hmm. um, so we've wanted to wrestle with that, and uh, now's the perfect time since uh, yeah. we're in the throes of the legislative sausage grinding process. Um, yeah, it, boy, sausages are being ground fine. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah. So let me let me just start off with uh, my pitch for why uh, uh, there there is no real fundamental philosophical divide uh, between. You and me, I don't think, on this mm -hmm. issue, uh, because I'm willing to throw in the philosophical towel. Uh, I then we don't have a fight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, that is, uh, I am I am perfectly willing to concede uh, an appropriate role for government uh, in ensuring that all Americans have access to some uh, adequate medical care, and that people uh, uh, that. At some defined level of adequate medical care, no one uh, no one should go without because of inability to pay. Good. Uh, the big question then is uh, is how do you, how do you make there, one, how do you get yeah, there from here? Right. Let me let me make one point on that, and in the spirit of you know congenial agreement, uh, there was actually a, 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 a Roger Cohen had a passage in a in his op ed today uh, from Hayek. Uh, which expresses the same view that you uh, just expressed. And, you know, I think basically uh, uh, one of the reasons that the more egalitarian types like me and more classical liberal types like you can agree on this is because there is maybe an equality aspect to making sure that everybody has health care, but there's also, you know, there also is a public good aspect to it. It does promote the general welfare and um, I think, you know, uh, and, and also, and also supply, a, you know, insurance that supplies a, a kind of a missing market. So there are there are many roads that lead to the Rome that you just described. Yeah, uh, and and, uh, uh, and you're right that, that Hayek uh, was okay with uh, with the idea of of uh, universal uh, health coverage. Um, Milton Friedman uh, proposed a uh, catastrophic. Uh, national health insurance program. That is, his idea was, or one of his reform proposals was that you have single payer catastrophic care and then completely deregulated health insurance provision for uh, all the bells and whistles above uh, uh, above that minimum. Yeah. Um, so, so this isn't a, a notion that's. Uh, I'm not sort of unique in my uh, uh, apostasy from 200 proof libertarianism here. Yeah. Uh, two of the biggest names in the libertarian, uh, uh, you know, uh, list of greats. Uh, yeah. Well, those are the two guys who I teach in my lines. political philosophy course, Friedman and Hayek. They're in my, the course I'm teaching this term, those are the, I, you know, the classical liberals who, uh, yeah. who are... And, the, the, you know, the two biggest, like some most influential classical liberal intellectuals yeah. of the 20th century. Yes. Um, so uh, the big question, though, is how do we get there from here? And mm -hmm. and uh, on this score, I'm sure we're on opposite sides of of the current fence. And the current fence mm -hmm. is the uh, uh, the legislation now making its way through Congress. Uh, I think it's a, a bad idea and is going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know I'm sure you're getting less and less excited about it the, <laughs> the closer it gets to the finish line. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, but I'm, I, I assume you're rooting for. Uh, uh, for this proposal to somehow or another yeah. uh, <clears throat> make it through uh, as intact as possible, uh, but maybe you could just give me your take yeah. on well, your druthers and uh, and and what's going on, and whether there's yeah. a point at which you're just willing to throw up your hands and say this is such a 
watered down kludgy mess that uh, that it's uh, it's uh, it would be better to try again later uh, or yeah. do you think anything is a start and you can improve it down the road so anyway why don't you give me your thoughts about where we are and where you'd like to be um, so l- let me start with the last point first which is I I do have a little bit of uh, get something get something up and right you know it's it's e- I do think it's a little bit easier to improve something that's up and running than to uh, you know get ha, than to just go back to the well all over right. again. This is a right. very tough uh, issue to, to to legislate about. Uh, uh, you know, we remember when Clinton tried it in ninety three, ninety four, and it was a disaster. But you know, there have been a series of these. Uh, efforts at health care reform and uh, it's a yeah, going back you know, 60 years they, they, I mean 48 yeah, and, yeah and so. five times and you know basically what you end up with are these incremental changes and sometimes the incremental changes like the you know the the Bush uh, drug uh, benefit are not so uh, terrific so we, this is a case where maybe you know the incremental changes are not always such a good thing so I, I do right. think that do it but my, my, basically uh, you know I have in, on this issue I have a pretty sharp Division between ends and means. I think there are three uh, three ends. Uh, you want everybody covered, as you just said. That's the point mm-hmm. where, where I think we have uh, philosophical agreement. Uh, secondly, and I'm sure you agree about this. Uh, you, to, not to put too fine a point on it, you don't want um, healthcare to be bankrupting uh, the government or the economy. More right. generally, and you know, at fifteen percent of uh, GDP, uh, you don't really want it going higher than that. We're already doing much worse on that than most than other places in the world. Uh, so, you, you want, as they say in, in, in your neighborhood, to you know bend the cost curve, on AKA yeah. you know, get the you know get the cost down. And also, it wouldn't be a bad idea if a uh, third goal is wouldn't be a bad idea if. Um, uh, on the basic measures like life expectancy and infant mortality, uh, you got some improvement so that we weren't running number you know twenty in the world on uh, those things. So, so those are the three goals: you get coverage for everybody, you try to you you draw, you keep the costs down, and uh, you get improvement on basic measures of uh, performance. My, my view uh, about that, you know, I'm, I, this is a really complicated problem. I'm not a health economist or even anywhere in the neighborhood of being one. I kind of feel like everything after that is, you know, I, I'm kind of agnostic. So I kind of like a single-payer system. I think there's a logic to it. As for the public option, I think really the amount of um, drum beating about the how it's essential to have a public option in this is I think is just either um, uh, confusion about what a public option does for you. Uh, people sometimes think you can't get universal coverage without a public option, and now people have said, "Gee, hmm, Switzerland, Holland, they have universal coverage, no public option." There's no essential connection between uh, the two. Uh, so I, you know, it's 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 confusion about what you get from a public option, or uh, there are people who think you want to have a public option because it's a, a you know a way station to get in single payer. I'm not so sure that that's a you know an attractive way station. Uh, and yeah. uh, you know, I think if you have a public option that covers 15 million people, uh, which is the kind of you know numbers that people are talking about. You know, I don't know. I don't know if that's a particularly good thing. How much bargaining leverage does a public option that covers that few people have with respect to private insurance companies? I don't know. Could you end up with a public option uh, getting, you know, be, getting all the people who haven't been cherry picked by private insurance companies? You could. Does the fact that there's regulation that says that the private insurance companies aren't allowed to cherry pick mean that they won't cherry pick? Of course not. Regulation doesn't always work. You know. So, I, so I think the. The, I think it's really been a mistake uh, for people to, you know, beat so hard on the uh, uh, the public option uh, uh, drum. And my, as I say myself, I think you know I could. If somebody, let me put it this way to bring it around: if, if somebody told me uh, ten years from now um, that 
40 percent, you know, 40 million people still didn't have health insurance, I'd be pretty unhappy about that, as I gather right. with you. If somebody told me uh, 10 years from now, you know, the American health care system doesn't have a public option, the first thing I would say is, well, does everybody have health insurance? You know, I, I don't, it, it doesn't matter intrinsically to me whether there's a public option or not. Yeah. So that's, okay. uh, that's a, that's a, maybe a 20,000 feet, but that's my general take on the issue of the debate. And I, uh, yeah. uh, go ahead. No, go, no, I was, go, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I don't like the idea, I'm, I'm pretty intransigently opposed to the idea of a, of a Canadian style single payer, uh, program. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <clears throat> I don't, I wouldn't object uh, if somehow or another this could just sort of magically happen uh, to what I just mentioned as something that Milton Friedman had proposed, which mm-hmm. is uh, which is uh, <clears throat> national catastrophic health insurance, uh, uh, so that uh, there is uh, public financing of uh, of uh, you know big dollar care, um, mm-hmm. so to ensure that that uh, that. No one is wiped out by uh, by disease or chronic illness, um, <clears throat> and then allow private saving and private insurance to fill in all the gaps. That that strikes me as one uh, market friendly option. Uh, the other market friendly option is just to deregulate uh, private insurance altogether, uh, and then subsidize the poor and chronically ill uh, so that everybody has access. Uh, I. I am a firm uh, believer in markets, uh, and so to me, anything that suggests that uh, that we're better off with some kind of universal soup to nuts monopoly uh, than mm-hmm. with competition and choice is going to ring my alarm bells uh, pretty seriously. And that's mm-hmm. uh, and so that's that's why the Canadian style system is just yeah. uh, is just unattractive to me. And I and I think ultimately, uh, it's it's. Uh, biggest danger is uh, that when you put all of uh, health spending on the government budget, uh, then you're going to have a budget constraint, and then you're going to have, uh, of course, you have to have rationing under any system. This system, you'd have government doing all the financing, you'd have government doing the rationing, and and that, I'm afraid, would lead to putting downward pressure on uh, the prices paid uh, to both providers and to drug companies uh, and lead to bad incentives for innovation down the road. Uh, and so I think anything we want to do to ensure fairness and more inclusiveness today uh, should not be done at the expense of uh, what are sure to be enormous potential gains in the future from uh, continuing uh, innovation in, in drugs and in procedures. And so anything that uh, that... that uh, helps the present by uh, beggaring the future strikes me as a very very bad deal. Um, so anyway, I've got two uh, uh, options that that seem to me fine. Um, I, what what seems to me not fine at all is uh, is where we are right now. This employment based uh, health insurance system is just uh, a goofy bad idea uh, that is this strange artifact of of path dependence coming out of World War II uh, price controls and wage controls, and we're stuck with this weird system that lavishes subsidies indiscriminately through the uh, exclusion of of health insurance from income, uh, and indeed uh, gives the biggest subsidies to the highest income people uh, because uh, they're the ones in the highest tax brackets, and so the exclusion is, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, most of the biggest tax expenditures are on uh, for high income folks. Uh, and then it introduces all these terrible rigidities uh, that if you uh, lose or change your job and uh, and owe, over the course of your last job you got sick and you've got a pre-existing condition, you can't get insurance again. Uh, and that whole problem is is due to tying uh, health insurance to your employer. And then there's just it's just just fundamentally nutty. Why? Why is your employer in charge of your health insurance? He's not in charge of your life insurance, your car insurance. Why is this thing of such Deep personal significance to you. Uh, why is that? Why is that tied up with your job? Uh, it just makes no sense to me. And so, I think the the fundamental problem with uh, 
President Obama's. I don't know. Could, we could, could just go to this point for a minute about the fact that it's of deep personal significance to you, and it's tied up with your job. I'm, I'm trying to connect that to my own uh, experience. Uh, so I have, you know, employer provided health yep. insurance through Stanford University, as you could imagine. Uh, you know, this is a, it's a very attractive health insurance plan. Yep. Um, uh, health insurance and health care are of deep uh, personal importance to me, but there's a huge amount of choice of within the employer-based system that um, uh, that Stanford provides. It's not as though Stanford is saying, uh, you know, here's your doctor or here's the HMO you have to go to, or, or even that you have to go to an HMO. There's a, right. you know, and, and, and which, where, you know, I live in San Francisco. I teach in Palo Alto. I can, if I'm, if I want to pay more, I can get my health care in uh, San Francisco. I can pay less and get it in Palo Alto. I can pay even more and get it, you know, wherever I happen to be uh, located at the time, if I'm away or something. So I, I, I think it, I think maybe you're exaggerating the extent to which maybe it's overkill to say that an employer-based uh, healthcare system is in some way, uh, uh, you know, intrusive on uh, in important uh, uh, private well, it's just, it's, uh, decisions. It's just, maybe it's just I was overreading. It's just, what, yeah, it's just yeah. a completely random. Uh, package yeah. deal uh, that yeah. your job and your health insurance uh, go agree. together, um, and and uh, in addition to the problems I mentioned, the the the, the way the subsidies are distributed, uh, yeah. and um, and the rigidities uh, and and real hardships uh, that are caused by linking uh, yeah. health insurance and employment. Then there is the problem that because the costs are invisible to the employee. We've created this whole culture that health insurance, that good health insurance, is first dollar coverage, uh, which is a complete perversion of the whole idea of what insurance is all about. You don't, uh, you don't, your homeowner's insurance doesn't pay your utility bills, your auto insurance doesn't pay, uh, you know, to refill at the pump. Routine expenses going through an insurance system is just wacky, uh, and so I think if we did have uh, <clears throat> a private a truly privatized, deregulated health insurance market, it wouldn't look like this. It would be for uh, risky contingencies that uh, that uh, that cost you a lot of money. And so you pay a modest premium to insure yourself against that bad outcome. And for the rest, uh, you save. Uh, and we could have uh, tax-favored savings to ensure that uh, that that uh, that you know people do save. You could have compulsory savings uh, to ensure that people do save. Uh, but a big part of the uh, escalating cost problem is that uh, the the folks involved in medical care decisions aren't the people who pay the bill, and so they don't have an incentive to economize in any kind of sensible way. Uh, we all look around the world these days for countries that uh, that we think are, do a better job of providing uh, uh, health care financing than the United States. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah. My, my, favorite, uh, my favorite would be Singapore. And uh, there they've got an health, excellent uh, health care system. Their life expectancy is higher than ours. It's one of the highest in the world. And uh, their total health care spending in the country, pro public and private, is uh, comes in under 5% of GDP. And their government... Uh, 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 Spending on health care is uh, under one and a half percent of GDP. They've got a combination mm -hmm. of public provision, that is actual public hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, and then they've got uh, a, a, a national catastrophic health insurance plan, and then they've got compulsory savings. Uh, but when, when, you, when you say that that's your, uh, I mean, we, we, when we look around the world and we look for places that meet the desiderata that you just described, yep. and, and, and that I described, so take the three goals that I described earlier. One goal is that everybody is covered. We agree on that. Another yep. is that you're not bankrupting the economy or the government. And you right. can, you know, there are a lot of numbers that are smaller than fifteen percent, right? You know, t uh, like fourteen, eleven, you know, and uh, and that you also do better on basic measures of health uh, performance, not health care yes. performance, but health performance. You know, infant mortality, life expectancy being. Um, now you look around the world, and basically. Uh, there are lots of places like um, Canada, sure. 
Yeah. Uh, I, the, the, the innovation yeah. issue, I think, right. is very important. You got Canada, you got France, you got Germany, you got Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark. Uh, you know, basically. Yeah, so to me, the, yeah. To me, the big yeah. right now on the on the cost control front, everybody does better than us, uh, and on on access and inclusiveness, yeah. pretty much everybody does better than us. Uh, right. The, the the big issue is and on performance and, 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 and on performance. Yeah. And on, and on, and on performance, uh, there, I think. Uh, the the fact is, I don't think there's much connection between marginal the marginal healthcare spending dollar and and health outcomes. Uh, basically, because in the United States, at least, about maybe as much as half of healthcare spending doesn't really have any discernible uh, impact on improving health. Yeah, uh, and right. yeah. li- lifestyle issues uh, and uh, you know exercise, diet, uh, smoking, things like that uh, have a much bigger impact uh, on on uh, on you know <clears throat> life expectancy and on infant mortality than than the quality of our healthcare system. But th- th- but that said, uh, so uh, Let, you know, let's hope pre- let's hope the president doesn't make your point because if he says anything about lifestyle issues, you know he'll get he'll, he'll get beaten up for telling people how to run their lives. But anyway, that's yeah, the, a sidebar the, point. Go the, ahead. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> you can make, you're allowed to make the point. Yeah. The the big question is uh, is uh, is who's going to keep innovation going? And there I'm a, I believe that the European uh, systems, the rest of the world is basically free riding off of, yeah. of U.S. What, we spend so much, not without doing a lot of good necessarily for American patients, uh, yeah. but, uh, but we do do a lot of good for American drug companies. Some disproportionate yeah. share of, of the overall drug market is the U.S. market, and so yeah. everybody produces for the U.S. market, and it's a cash cow, and and that's yeah. a good thing. It encourages yeah. insurance, and so uh, excuse me, it encourages innovation. it encourages yeah. innovation, and and we just don't know what would happen if the U.S. adopted a European style system, um, and I'm I'm worried uh, that that cutting out uh, those profits. Uh, on a, mm-hmm. you know, that that right now are sort of the U.S. is the profit sanctuary for the world pharmaceutical industry, yeah. uh, and for and for a whole lot of, of innovative new techniques and medical devices. Uh, if we put the downward price pressure on those guys that uh, that Europe does, then then I'm afraid that we're we're really harming the future. So what I would like to do is have a system that has cost control and has inclusiveness, uh, but that. But that does it through greater reliance on markets, greater reliance on uh, on. Uh, well, let me ask you a question. Consumer, let me, let me consumer it, responsibility you know. for routine care, uh, and and therefore preserves um, market incentives for innovation. So that's 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 my pitch for why we're heading in the wrong direction. We've got this employment-based system that I think is is just ill-conceived and a bad yeah. idea. Look, every and people and who what we're now and what we're now doing is expanding it. We're gonna you know we're going to. Uh, we're going to uh, bring in, you know, tens of millions of more people into it. Um, we're going to ramp up the co- the yeah. costs of the premiums through guaranteed issue and community rating. Then we're going to have to subsidize people because it's unaffordable. So that's going to boost up the yeah. cost side. Then we're going to try to make, you know, at least wave our hands at cost control. But when you do that, you get death panels hysteria. Uh, so I'm I'm worried that that uh, that the current health care uh, reform package is is just not going to it's not going to meet any of our uh, criteria. Look, there there, there are two position there are two views out there that don't like uh, in the employer based health care system. There are people like you who would like yeah. to. You know, have a government floor and then let everything else be run through competitive markets, although markets for health insurance are not particularly competitive. Now, I know if you took away all the regulation, they'd become much more competitive. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we don't know what yeah, they would look like. Exactly. Yeah, that might, you anticipate my point. We don't know what they would look like. And so it's not like, it's not obvious that you're introducing a lot more competition, uh, by, um, uh, if you keep the thing uh, uh, deregulated and privatized because the insu- because the insurance market is so heavily monopolized and oligopolized right now. But uh, um, uh, but so but the other people who don't like the employer based uh, health insurance system are the single single payer people. Right now, the deal is uh, we're not going to get a single payer system. 
And, right. uh, you know, I think there's a logic and an illogic to a single-payer system. Uh, you've, you know, expressed the illogic of it. I think there's a logic to a single-payer system in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing overhead costs. You don't have to pay marketing costs to sell health insurance to yep. people, and you got some real bargaining leverage right. uh, with uh, – so and then you know, but I think we 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 agree that there were there were worries under a single payer system, particularly on the innovation side, and you know, so so but that, the single payer is not going to happen. Right. Uh, uh, we are not going to move to, and we're not going to eliminate. Uh, what fifty eight percent of the population gets its uh, uh, health insurance through uh, uh, in, uh, plans at work. Yep. Uh, w- one of the things that I think uh, the Obama people learned early in the game was there's a, that one of the big differences about between debating this issue in Democratic primaries and trying to get legislation through is when you're in the Democratic primary, everybody's competing for the best plan that covers all the uninsured. Right. When you get into proposing a piece of legislation, you got you have to do something for the you know the people who are insured. Uh, which is 85% yeah. of the population, right. including the 60% that have employer-based plans. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I I think the issue here is we're not moving away from an, an employer-based system, and so what's the best improvement on a system in which 60% of the population continue to get their uh, insurance through yeah, uh, I, I, employers, and and I think maybe you're exa- you know not a, not an ideal system. I be I would like to have a system where people aren't getting their insurance that way for all the reasons you mentioned, including the uh, portability pre existing condition issue. But that's uh, yeah, the I, issue I, is I yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. There, so a couple of thoughts. One, uh, just uh, th- there's a way to get there from here that isn't just uh, you know. Uh, outlawing tomorrow everybody's current uh, or right. eliminating tomorrow everybody's current uh, employer provided insurance and that is uh, to move away from the current uh, <clears throat> exclusion from income uh, of, yeah. of employer provided health care and instead uh, provide an individual uh, tax credit for uh, health insurance so you move you move the payer uh, from the yeah. employer to the employee, uh, and so the the employee becomes the purchaser of health insurance. Uh, and and certainly initially, probably uh, it, it would there would be a lot of inertia, and people would stick with what they've got. Uh, but over time, as they've got the money, uh, individual people would uh, be moving towards a system that where it, there isn't any necessary connection w- between employment and, and health insurance. And so that would be that would be the route. Um, you're you're right, uh, I think, to characterize, uh, and this is the way President Obama characterized his proposals. Uh, ca- the, the current approach is a conservative approach uh, that you've yeah. got the kind of yeah. radical solutions on either end, uh, right. moving to an individual based system like I'd like to have, mm-hmm. or to a uh, government based system like in Canada, like mm-hmm. single payer advocates want to have. And he's and in his speech before Congress, he. Yeah. He really uh, framed it that way, that you've got these radicals on either side. I want to stick with mm-hmm. what we've got. Most people like their health care coverage, and so let's stick with what most people are satisfied with and, and, uh, and build yeah. on that. Uh, and, uh, and I thought it was a very attractive way to frame the issue politically uh, in terms yeah. of this is, yeah. this is the conservative kind of common sense way to go about doing things. Uh, alas, yeah. I, I think our health care financing system is do- so dysfunctional that yeah. the conservative stick with what we've got approach is, uh, is, going, to, is going to lead to disappointing results. Let me, let me ask this question, and maybe we should move off this in a little while. Uh, but yep. uh, w- w- one last point on this, which is suppose, you know, it's hard to know exactly what's being proposed yet, and but you know I I have been a just a sidebar point here. I've been a kind of pessimist all along about something getting passed because partly mm-hmm. reflecting on the past history, partly reflect, reflecting on the current um, uh, uh, politics, and in particular the in particular the intransigence of the Republicans to. Uh, yep. Support anything, but uh, but now I, now now I'm I kind of think you know something is likely to something like the plans that are you know on the table uh, some mix of them is likely to emerge. Um, and do, do you think that uh, 
the if if a let's you know if something like the Senate Finance Committee plan were adopted, uh, that it would make it harder or less hard to um, start taxing uh, employer based health insurance. I'm I'm just not really sure. Uh, yeah. I I think yeah. that uh, that by universalizing the current system, uh, it's it, it's just going to be a bigger transition away from it because more people are in it and it's more locked in by an even larger edifice of subsidies and regulations, and so there's just more to undo. So my, my sense is it makes it a little, a little bit harder. Uh, I mean, suppose, you know, suppose, uh, you know, some sensible, you know, conservative, you know, more conservative, more classically liberal administration comes in and, you know, in 2000 and in probably yeah. in 2016 or something like that, uh, the health insurance, health care issue has not, has miraculously not gone away. There's been a health insurance, there's a big debate about the merits. And, the, and then the, there's a proposal that's made, which is to introduce, uh, you, know, ta- you know, taxation of employer-provided plans or taxation of Cadillac employer-provided right. plans. Um, seems to me, I, you know, I, I may be, you know, taking a shot completely in the dark here, but it's hard for me to see why, a reform like that, whatever its merits, why a reform like that would be less likely after a reform was passed than without having a reform. And for that reason, I think um, you should be less um, unhappy about the yeah, reform. I, I, I must say, I don't, yeah. I don't consider this, you know, the uh, some battle for the soul of, uh, of yeah. America at all. I think, I think yeah. we have a messed yeah. up kludgy system now, and we're going to have a messed up kludgy system yeah. uh, after uh, yeah. Congress gets through. And yeah. Um, and yeah. yes, it's, it may be possible to unwind uh, the system, and it may be that experimenting with with these reform proposals is going to show that they don't control costs, and uh, and that uh, and and therefore sort of <clears throat> advance the political discovery process towards better reform. So yeah. that's right. possible. Right. I think that, that once you have once you have the mandate. Uh, so that mm-hmm. everybody has to buy insurance, and yeah. you've kind of defined what insurance is, and it's going yeah. to be defined yeah. as yeah. as you know, uh, low deductible uh, uh, yeah. kind of insurance that we have. It it does mm-hmm. it does require throwing it into reverse longer to get back mm-hmm. to the right point yeah. to get on the right road. So I, I think it will make it harder, but but it could be that the that the failures of it that it could explode premium costs uh, yeah. and yeah. It, the subsidies to make it affordable to people under the mandate could be right. so expensive that it produces a real fiscal train wreck. So it, it's possible yeah. that it would accelerate yeah. it just because it, the results are so disappointing. But yeah. uh, Let me ask you a different know. question. Uh, uh, take where we are now uh, on the on the reform, take the, pro- take the proposals that are on the table now, as, the pro- as opposed to proposals that were on the table, I don't know, four months ago. Five, yeah. You know, when we just when we start, do you think they're better or worse? I mean, I know you're not spending all your time looking at, reading, pouring over every yeah. detail in these bills. Do you think that there's been an improvement uh, in what's on the table through the process? No, no. Uh, I, I think. Uh you know, I, I the whole uh, death panels hysteria. I think was was a, yeah, was a hysteria well, about the o- the only good idea in this <laughs> this whole uh, <laughs> process, which is to is to start imposing some kind of cost effectiveness criteria on Medicare spending. Um, yeah, and yeah. and so with that defeat, that means yeah. that the, the the conceit that you're going to pay for the the new people in the system through cost savings in the existing system is, I'm afraid, out the window. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, I think we're heading towards a much more expensive, uh, you know, uh, government budget for healthcare uh, than we were going to have before. Um, the even though the price tags on these proposals have gone down, uh, they have, uh, yeah. but. Um, I guess what I think, I, I, this is a kind of, uh, you know, it's very easy to beat up on all the uh, participants in the uh, in these discussions and very easy to say, you know, there's uh, Obama with his, you know, super veto-proof super majority in the Senate and the majority in the House, and look at what these clowns, 
have done. They've made a mess of this thing. And, and I kind of don't have that. I sort of view about it. I guess I think there's, that there's been some uh, improvement. There's been some value to the, to the fights and to the pushback. And, uh, that what we're going to end up with is something that's probably messier than any, anybody's initial design would have been. But, um, that's going to be probably, an improvement on the legislation that, w- that was uh, uh, initially put on the table. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a, you know, maybe it's only a one-handed applause, but uh, for, you know, there is some kind of, import, you know, importance in this. Uh, it's easy to piss on the political process. This is a, a kind of mild bit of praise for the for the uh, political process. Well, well since, since this is a depressing topic, let's let's wrap that up <laughs> yeah, on, that, yeah, on that cheery yeah. note. And, and, <laughs> right. and uh, let, yeah. let's let's mo- let's move on to the rest of Obama's agenda. And we'll talk about it just yeah. in broad brush from you know from uh, sort of the high altitude. But uh, yeah. but you know here here he comes in this charismatic figure, big victory, yeah. transformational president, huge majorities in both houses, yeah. lots of uh, of. Of exuberant excitement uh, on the left that that the the latent progressive majority in America has finally uh, has come out of the culture war fog uh, mm. and uh, and yeah. sees its interests clearly now and we're going to have a yeah. new day and yeah. that yeah. was then this is now <laughs> yeah and then uh, and then Obama at least in the first instance didn't disappoint that is he didn't uh, he he came uh, with a, a very uh, broad, ambitious agenda on a whole host of different fronts uh, on the domestic policy side. Uh, let's bracket his wimping out on the foreign policy and, and war on terror side. Uh, but on domestic policy, charged ahead with uh, not only the big stimulus plan, but uh, cap and trade legislation and uh, health care uh, and financial sector uh, regulation. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's been... Uh, it, it hasn't been one triumph after another. Uh, you were recounting to me before yeah. we talked uh, about the, the Saturday Night Live skit where yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 this from this past weekend, where Obama was countering charges that he was a socialist by uh, by arguing, "Look, I, I haven't done anything." Uh, right? Yeah. And, no, there's uh, a checklist of all the things he hasn't done. It's um, a long list. So, <coughs> so certainly, he, certainly he, there, is, uh, the, there is a moment in the skit where he says, "You know, but okay, so you know, then I brought together." Uh, a black professor and a white police officer who, you know, who else could have done that? Oh, well, okay, Oprah could have done that, but nobody else (laughs) besides me and Oprah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not uh, an unbroken record of triumph, for sure, yeah. um, Yeah. So, do you think that the uh, the, the kind of thoughts that this was a big ideological shift were wishful thinking? Do you think that Obama has blown it by in, in with tactical missteps? You as a person on the left, yes. uh, yeah. what's what's your assessment of, of what's happened? Yeah. Um, I don't think just on the last, what you put it about blowing it on the basis of tactical missteps, I don't think that's happened. I think uh, there are a couple of things. Um First of all, um, why did Obama, you know, win the election? Um, lots of reasons why he won it, but among them, uh, this was one of these cases where the outcome in the election was perfectly predicted by the conventional economic models yes. of elections. Uh, and you know, this is you know before the September uh, financial crisis. Right. Uh, the, the economy, you know, was, we all know, wasn't in very good shape. So you got a, an extremely un, you know, an extremely unpopular president, uh, a war that's sort of dragging on. That's nobody's right. favorite. You know, mobilize the populace uh, war, and and then m- most Im- importantly, it's the economy. Stupid, the economy is uh, uh, performing pretty badly, um, and you know, the it, it was no great surprise that. Uh, you know, Obama won the election. I mean, you could say he, you know, there was the difficulty of the fact that he was, uh, you know, an, an African American candidate and, uh, that was a, that was a hurdle for him to overcome. Um, yep. you know, I think there's probably some reason to think there are a lot of people, there are a bunch of people who like the fact that they, that he was, a, and I don't mean yep. just African Americans, uh, people who, you know, who thought that this was a very good thing. And so there may have been some, he may have won some support on that side. In any case, I don't, I didn't, um, 
first thing is, uh, I didn't see uh, the, the, his election as a sign of a big uh, ideological uh, shift, but as it seemed kind of like normal politics. Uh, yep. Secondly, I think when you go back to the to the um, uh, to the primaries, uh, it's by no means uh, the case that uh, Obama was running as I can put it this way, the most progressive Democrat. So consider, right. for example, the health care issue. Uh, you had, you know, I, I'm almost embarrassed to use his name now, John Edwards, <laughs> yes. uh, a total pig. Um, and I confess I gave him uh, some money early in the game because he was pushing hard on the health care issue, disgusting person. He was, um, I thought he was a slime ball from way back. I know, I know you did. You said you were you were from his part of the world, and uh, I remember one of our earliest conversations. And on this, uh, uh, and on this, as not only on this, but on this, you were absolutely right, and I was wrong. A bad uh, judge of character in this case, and I feel awful. You know, it's just disgusting. It makes me feel dirty to have given him money. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, but he was he, he was the guy who was running strongest on the health care issue. But even when Edwards was out. Obama was the guy who wasn't prepared to say that he was going to put forward a health care plan that was going to cover everybody. That's right. No, he was you running know, to I the mean, right he was, yeah. yeah, he was running to the right. On this issue, he was running to the right of, uh, of uh, Clinton and, uh, and, and, get, and, you know, and getting beaten up for it. Uh, and, um, th- there were, and on the trade issue, he was not particularly running as you know, the progressive. Ca- so I, I think there's this absurdity about... Uh, you know the, the stuff about Obama being a socialist. A con- you know, for, forget about the, the taking that literally. But even as rhetorical, you know, as rhetoric, it's not too good. I mean, this guy is basically, uh, you know, a kind of you know liberalish centrist uh, Democrat uh, who has I I don't think has ever um, you know he's not been the guy who's been way out front on either domestic policy issues or on foreign policy stuff. So I don't think there's any, you know, I don't think there's been any uh, uh, big shift. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, I think it was my colleague, uh, Mo Fiorina, who's a, you know, fantastic student of American politics, who I think he's uh, said after the uh, election that, you know, all of this talk about having a veto-proof majority and having a majority in Congress and that, you know, Obama's now going to be able to get anything he wants, that this came from just utter abysmal, if I can put it this way, this wasn't his words, kind of pig ignorance on the part <laughs> of commentators about what the Democratic Party is like. Right. Uh, you know, the old Will Rogers remarks about, you know, I don't belong to any organized political party, I'm a Democrat, have a, you know, have a great deal of force, and we've seen them um, in play. So I think he's got uh, a very... Uh, fractious party. Uh, he has not been pushed very hard from the left of the party, um, uh, uh, and not because he's been doing everything that the left of the party wants. On the contrary, uh, there are a lot yeah. of people who are unhappy on the health care thing, uh, and now they've given up on any kind of you know climate bill for this year. So there's a lot of unhappiness. We haven't been getting any pressure there, but it's so I think there's, uh, the, the election was a normal election. I don't think of Obama as a particularly markedly progressive Democrat. Um, no, I'm not saying that just as a description. And, and uh, I think uh, the Democrats uh, are, a, you know, a very divided uh, a bunch of people. And the, the results of this are not all that shocking. That said, uh, you know, there's not a lot that's happened so far that's been really inspiring, though if they get a health care bill, through uh, in this, uh, I think he's going to look. Um, I think they will get one through, and I think he's going to end up getting a lot of uh, credit for it. And one of the things that he's going to get credit for, and that's, this is something I think he deserves credit for, is this is a really, really patient guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this getting this uh, legislation through has taken a lot of patience, and uh, it hasn't happened yet. But if it gets through, it's going to owe something to his. Um, Willingness to, uh, despite a twenty four seven news cycle and despite the blogosphere, and you know, to just keep his eye on the prize, uh, stay a course, and, uh, and 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 you know, keep and, and uh, 
be prepared to play with lots of people. So I think he will get credit for it. I think he'll, I think he'll deserve some for it. I'm yeah, sorry, that was very long-winded, Brink, and I know we're almost out of time. I, I think it's uh, it's you know it's too early to tell. He could that it could be that just getting any health care reform bill through uh, is is seen as a real accomplishment, and as mm-hmm. the number of uninsured go down, uh, um, you know that will redound to his. Uh, political credit. It could be that the economy pulls out of its funk uh, in yeah. time for 2012, yeah. and he's looking good because that's, yeah. that's how you want it. You want to come in with bad times and, and get yeah. run for re-election during better times. Yeah. So it, it could all work out for him. Um, I, I think it could also go the other way, that it could yeah. be that the that the the dominant impression of, of the Obama presidency is one of sort of Overreach and failure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It could be mm-hmm. that the economy stays uh, really uh, sluggish and with high unemployment for years to come. Um, and uh, yeah. it could be that his legislative accomplishments, uh, <clears throat> once they actually are, are evaluated, look like uh, they weren't very good ideas. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's too early to tell, uh, but, but there's... Uh, there's there's a real possibility uh, that uh, well first I never thought that just as you said I, I never thought there was any ideological shift uh, to of note the, this was a throw the bums out election that mm-hmm. the bums richly deserved yeah. uh, their fate um, and uh, and I, I think that that probably Obama was uh, mistaken to take on so many high-profile things yeah. at once because there mm-hmm. just isn't agenda space for it, uh, especially yeah. with the economy the way it is, and, and yeah. it sets up the the impression of of, uh, of kind of disarray and and yeah. being a loser, and being a loser is a very bad thing to be if you're president. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially so when your staff positions aren't particular, <laughs> you know, twenty percent filled or whatever. Yeah, no, that's right. that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I, I think I think we have a real you know governance problem in this country. The Republicans clearly just don't care about governance. They care about mm-hmm. culture war posing uh, these days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there are Democrats who care about it, but they care about it from just a completely incoherent set of uh, of of spaces on the ideological spectrum. So they can't really work coherently with one another uh, yeah. on much of anything. So. Yeah. Um, I, I agree on that last point. I think the danger for the Democrats of not being seen really as a governing party is uh, has been increased through this uh, process. But the, 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 the elephant in the room here, or waiting to come into the room, or whatever the right metaphor is, which we haven't talked about at all, and I think this could be you know, more than anything else decisively shape the fate of the Obama administration is the Afghanistan issue. And I think yep. that's a case where there are, uh, no, politically speaking, maybe in other respects, more important respects as well, but politically speaking, there are no really good choices. If he follows the recommendations of throwing lots more uh, troops in, um, uh, he's there, I think, the uh, more you know progressive Democrats are going to uh, walk away from him. Yep. Um, that could really do it. If he decides to go with the, you know, the Joe Biden and apparently General Jones uh, strategy, I think he is going to come under a, uh, a, a, you know, an onslaught from the, um, uh, you know, ex- the, you know, the, 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 inter- the, the, the neoconservative interventionist uh, uh, Republicans um, uh, in 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 a way that may make the attacks on him over the past few months seem pretty mild. Right. I, um, think, I think that's possible. No, and, and I think I think substantively there isn't uh, there you know there's no attractive choice. Uh, yes. Either yeah. th- throw a lot more money and lives at this you know rat's nest of a, <laughs> a country and uh, and. Not have anything to show for it, or pull yeah. out and watch it fall apart and get blamed for it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, either way, uh, anyway, I'm for I'm for uh, I'm against uh, an Afghanistan surge. I, I think that that, yeah. that an open ended nation building yeah. commitment there is is just uh, a bad bad idea. Um, but I I agree that that. Um, that especially now, after he'd made the initial commitment to that kind of strategy, yeah. uh, changing his mind is yeah. going to set him up for, uh, and then is going to set yeah. him up for a lot of 
uh, a lot of political grief. And then just given the way the country is polarized and there's such you know such a yeah. significant block of the country that thinks he's this you know Muslim candidate yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Uh, that this is going to send them into orbit. So yeah, uh, yeah. no, I, I think that, that that that's right. I mean, I think what he what what he could do and. and you know, I think it's very. He's certainly not just going to say we're, you know, we're gone. It was not, you know, it was nice knowing you, Afghanistan. Oh, of uh, I think that you know the choice is between um, this, uh, uh, the, you know, the the as you're rightly calling it, the Afghanistan surge strategy. You throw in a bunch more troops, you do stuff in more populated areas, and then this um, uh, this other strategy of uh, of um, uh, the military part, the military part of the strategy is to, you know, go after the Al Qaeda right. uh, Taliban, and you're not focused principally on uh, population areas. Yep. Uh, and I think the, you know, it, it will take all of if Obama decides to pursue that strategy, it will take all of his considerable rhetorical gift to say that when I said this was a war of necessity, not a war of choice, this is one we really have to fight. Uh, we are fighting it by right. doing what you know the Joe Bidens and the General Joneses are proposing, rather than the McChrystals, and uh, uh, that's going to be a tough. Uh, so it's going to be, uh, polit- but but on the substance of the issue, which I, you know at the end of the day is more important, I'm uh, entirely in uh, agreement with you. This is not a place to put um, a lot of money and a lot of young kids uh, get a bunch of people killed. Uh, and continue the record of uh, previous uh, intervention in Afghanistan, which is yeah. an unbroken record of uh, miserable Fairly failure. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, on speaking of happy notes, Brent, that's a. <laughs> you, I think that's a good place to yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were going to talk about other stuff, but we're out of time. Uh, yeah. Great chatting with you. Hope we can do good it again talk. soon. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Me Take too. care, Josh. Bye now.